Well, in thought, thinking about First Peter and the theme that he has, I've been doing a lot of reading about persecution worldwide. And I read a particular report this week that highlighted not only are Christians being persecuted worldwide at a far higher rate than any other demographic group in the world, but now churches are being persecuted corporately, not just individually, but corporately. Buildings are being burned down. Uh, all kinds of things are being done. And as that increases, and I'm talking about in America, by the way. Yeah, it's always happened worldwide, but it's increasing here in the U.S., and there is statistical data to prove it, that it is happening in a rapidly growing rate. My concern isn't with that, because Jesus told us we were going to be persecuted. My concern is when it comes, what we are tempted to do, and a lot of people, when persecution comes at you specifically because you're a follower of Jesus, the temptation might be to back down and be quiet, to just not make any waves, don't say anything about anything, don't poke the bear. You have all these phrases you've heard because we don't want the persecution to increase. What that leads to quite often is professing Christians who go along with the crowd so they won't draw attention to themselves, which is the exact opposite of what Peter says we need to do. As the church of Jesus Christ, we need to stand up for him. We need to identify fully with him no matter what the repercussions. And we also need to stand out for him. We need not only to just be different, but be different in a way that exalts God, that shows that his wisdom is wise, that puts the beauty of his truth on display. Do you believe that God gave us his word for our good? Amen. And it's not just for our good, but it's for the good of those around us, that we might be salt and what? Light, that we might be a preserving agent that also gives flavor that we might shine a light in darkness so people don't stumble. See, the church gathered together corporately should be the most beautiful thing on the planet. Loving each other, worshiping the Lord, meeting needs with gladness and sincerity of heart. All the things the Bible describes about the church is designed because we are the bride of Christ, amen? And we are supposed to be a beautiful bride. And that's Peter's concern. He doesn't want that bride to fade into the woodwork because there's pressure. He wants us to stand up as proud of our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you proud of Jesus? Are you thrilled that you get to represent him? This is what Peter wants us to grasp, no matter what comes our way. And as persecution increases, we can stand firm. He says in chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, because of so great a salvation, because of all that God has done for us in salvation, the right response is to be holy, to be sanctified. And that's the first of five major headings we have in the rest of this book. We've been talking about this, that sanctification to be holy, to be set apart, is supposed to show that we are beautiful. When you are holy, it should be attractive, right? Does that make sense? Holy people are not supposed to be nasty, ill-tempered, uh, mean-spirited. We are loving, gracious, kind, set-apart people who will represent the truth, but we do it with patience, with reverence, with love, with respect. Do you understand what I'm saying? And our relationships should be beautiful as we love each other, as we hope together in the soon return of Jesus Christ, as we grow in holiness, as we fear the Lord, as we love each other with a gladness and sincerity, that we do that with fervency. And then as we saw last week, as we crave the word, the more we as believers crave the word, the more we will get the benefit of it, and the more we will put that word on display as something that everybody ought to want in their life. 
I did a little research this week on some writings. There was a guy named R.A. Torrey, who was a pastor and an author way back in the late 1800s. And he wrote uh, this one section of a sermon and it's called, The Word of God Has Power. And I love this because we talked last week about craving the word and he gives a list of 11 things here, just real quick. The word of God has the power to convict of sin. It has the power to regenerate or to make you born again. It has the power to produce faith. It has the power to produce faith that prevails in prayer. It has the power to cleanse you, to build you up, to make you wise, to bring peace to your heart, to bring you joy, to bring you patience, comfort, and hope, and to protect you from false teaching. Is that a good reason to dive into the Bible? Man, all the things, and that's just a, just a sample of what the Word of God claims it will do in your life. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to grow in holiness, it's because we crave the Word. We love it more than our, 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 our daily food. We want it more than anything else. Maybe we're like Billy Graham and we make a commitment, I will not eat food on any day until I have read the Word. Wouldn't that be exciting if we did that as believers? A lot of people would lose a lot of weight, I fear. But I, I, I do think it would be a good thing. Are you with me on this? So this idea of the word, it's just all encompassing. And Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said this. And I was going to say this last week, ran out of time. Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the word of the Lord not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our inmost parts. It is idle merely to let the eye glance over the words or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historic facts, but it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scripture models. And what is better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. He goes on to say, I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his, you will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He has read it till his very soul was saturated with scripture. And though his writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, without continually making us feel and say, why this man is a living Bible. Wow, could that be said of us? This man is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere, his blood is bibline. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his very soul is full of the word of God. I commend his example to you, beloved. Wow. Wouldn't it be awesome if our church was filled with people like that? That everything that came at you, you would instantly think of Scripture. Is that right or is that wrong? Is this true? And a grid of Scripture would filter out everything the world is throwing at you. And you would only accept that which was true, that aligned with the Word of God. That's what Peter is saying. That's how you'll become holy. That's how you discern good and evil in your own heart, your own conscience, your own motives, your own actions, as well as in the world around you. And when we get to that point and we're doers of that word, we will stand out and be different. Amen? We will be truly holy and beautifully holy. That's what our challenge is here. So to that end, I came across a uh, something a guy wrote. He said, if you are not a disciplined reader of the Bible, it's because you have a greater confidence in your own ability to live your life. In other words, you think your wisdom is better than God's. If you are not disciplined in pursuing the word of God, it betrays that you don't trust it as you ought. And oh, friends, the more you're in it, the more you'll trust it. The more you're in it, the more you'll desire it. The more it will work in you as we saw about what R.A. Torrey said. So to that end, I gave a 90-day challenge. And I don't know if anybody anybody here willing to admit you're going to do it. We're going to read through the Bible in 90 days. Oh, yes, I love it. The rest of you repent. (laughs) 
No, I, I'm telling you, just be, be in the Word daily, but this is going to change your life. It's going to increase your habit. Your love for the Word of God is going to grow. You're going to see things. You're going to learn stories. You're going to just be changed in 90 days, all of us. And by the way, you should be through chapter 40, verse 11 as of right now. All right, so let's just keep going. Let's plow through and learn God's Word together. And if you are doing it, let me know. I want to pray for you. I want to encourage you. I want you to do this so that 90 days from now, we're going to be transformed. I believe that. And then hopefully it will become a habit of ours to be in the Word for the rest of our lives. So that said, let's dive now into our text for today, which is in verses 4 through 10. Peter has just said we need to crave the word and you might say why or you might even say how why am i craving the word and i i'm supposed to grow in it with respect to salvation for what purpose why am i so intent on growing why is it that big of a deal what am i supposed to do with that in the midst of persecution to grow in holiness and now he goes from the individual baby to a corporate building. And what he's gonna drive home here is, there are no Lone Ranger Christians. The church is critical to your growth and your sanctification. Not only yours, but it's critical that you help others grow in their sanctification. And so he dives into this text to say, we need to do this together. He says, in coming to him, Jesus, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up, and there's some other options I'll give you in a moment, as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now remember here, this is the context of people that are being persecuted and it's going to get worse, and they need to be holy. And so what he says here is critical. In your pursuit of holiness, you need to grow together. We need to grow together in Him. That's His point in these verses. We're going to have two more verses at the end of this next week that focus on lifestyle evangelism. But right here, He gives us a construction metaphor. We've learned a lot in the Bible about Jesus being the shepherd and we're a sheep and He's the bridegroom and we're the bride. But now He uses the image of a temple. And he's going to say that we are the temple today. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. We are not only a temple, but we are the priests in the temple. We are both and. And he's going to highlight that. And he's going to give us what we are to do, how we are to do it, and why we should do it. And this is a beautiful picture. I love any part of the Bible that emphasizes the local body and how we're supposed to be together. This is beautiful, what he says. So let's start with what. And the what is, grow together. Don't just grow as individual babies, grow together. And he says it in an interesting way, and grammar is another issue here. He says, verse 5, you also as living stones, and here is the central focus of the passage, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now the grammar here is an interesting thing because we don't use it that much in English. We kind of know by the way we say things is this a command. I mean, you, you, you could say uh, you are going to the store or you could say go to the store. Well, in Greek, it's similar, but it's through different endings on the verse that, or on the word that lets you know that. This is one of those interesting Greek verbs 
that you can't tell if it's an indicative or an imperative. You don't know if it's saying you are being built up or be built up. You understand what I'm here saying so far? So you can't tell by the structure of the word which one it's going to be. So grammarians and biblical scholars disagree over this. They go, well, some think it's an indicative, and the New American Standard translates that way. You also, as living stones, are being built up. Others think it's an imperative. And then give me more grammar. Are you still excited about grammar? Say yes anyway. <laughs> it's passive, but it could be middle. Say what? Well, it could either be saying, if it is a command, allow yourselves to be built up, allow someone else to build you up, or if it's middle, build yourselves up. And we can't be emphatic on any of those. But I lean toward it being an imperative, and I believe that it matches what else he's been doing in the flow of this passage. Each section, he has had a command that everything else is built around. Last time it was crave the word. Before that, it was to love the brethren. There's these commands that he tells us what we're supposed to do. Then he tells us how to do it and why to do it so we get the full picture. And if I'm right, this phrase right here is the focal point of the passage. And it reminds us of who we are, what we're supposed to do together as a church, and why we must do it no matter what. Now, in the last few years, we've experienced some elements with COVID and other things. We were told what we could and couldn't do. We had some government impositions on us and things, and we've had to make some decisions about what we were going to obey, what we weren't going to obey. And there could have been a lot of flack for that. Some churches did get a lot of flack for that. Some were highlighted. Some in Canada were, were locked up and pastors thrown in the jail. There may be a day coming where we're going to have to make a decision. What are we doing? And are we as a church going to be the church when the nation tells us we can't? You understand what I'm saying? This is not, this is not theoretical anymore. It's become very real even in a country like ours. And so we need to be ready for this. And so Peter is preparing a flock he cares deeply about that they will be committed to being corporate no matter what, to be together no matter what. And so let's take a look at that because we're not just supposed to be together, but we're supposed to grow when we're together. We're supposed to change, be progressively more holy. Our being together is genuine fellowship where we influence one another, where we are iron sharpening iron, where we are encouraging each other and admonishing each other and helping each other. You hear what I'm saying? It is supposed to be genuine body life so that we can be the beautiful bride we're supposed to be for the glory of our Savior. So I believe that's his focus here. We need to grow together in holiness so we can stand up and stand out together as a living building, a spiritual house. He says it in verse 5 here, you also as living stones. This is the metaphor. Jesus is the living stone, and because we've come into relationship with him, we've received his life, we are living stones as well. And so Jesus is the living stone. He's also called a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, verse 6, the stone which the builders rejected, the cornerstone, verse 7, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, verse 8. But this is metaphor of a building. And Jesus is the foundation of that building, and we build on him. We are all related to him. We grow in him. We grow in relationship to him. That's what it's all about. But we do it together. We encourage each other to love Jesus more, to become more like him, to study his word so we know his heart and his mind so that we can represent him. And so we are called as living stones and as a spiritual house. You know, is a living stone a strange metaphor? There's, there's a word we use for things like that. We call them oxymorons, right? It's a living stone. That's like a jumbo shrimp, isn't it? That's like military intelligence and all those other things that don't, oh, I'm sorry, those of you in the military. But anyway, you hear what I'm saying? 
living stone. You don't think of a stone being alive. You think of a stone, it's a stone, you pick it up, skip it off the water, or you carve it and make it a part of a foundation, and it just sits there. It does nothing else. But what he's saying is, no, this one's alive. And it's because of that life that we live. It's because of that life that we grow. It's because of that life the church will continue to grow and expand and stand dynamically for all time. He will build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Nothing's going to stop the church. Nothing. You are a part of the most dynamic, life-changing organism on the planet. It's alive. We are a part of that. We are living stones. We are in this and we grow. And as we grow, the building grows. As we get stronger, the whole structure gets stronger. You see the analogy he's given us here? It's an incredible picture. So he's saying that we're not any old building. It's a building that keeps growing, keeps getting bigger, keeps getting stronger. And it's a building because it's built on the living stone. Nobody can knock it over. There is a permanence to this. We are a permanent edifice that will have a profound impact on the world no matter what the world may think. So he says you are being built up, or I would believe you ought to say you are to allow yourselves to be built up or build yourselves up as a spiritual house. That built up word means to combine the parts into a whole. We are to take the individual parts and come together where we are fitted and to be that beautiful picture. You all have a role to play. Do you realize that? If you are a born again Christian, you have gifts and abilities and callings upon your life. You are a spiritual snowflake in the sense that your giftedness is radically different than anyone else. They have some similarities, but you are uniquely gifted to fit into the body, to fit into the building. You ever played Jenga? You never played Jenga? Isn't that what the name of the game is where you have those little things and you have to pull a piece out and you keep pulling them out until what happens? It falls over. That's what he's saying. Folks, let's not have any spiritual Jenga here. Every single part needs to be where it needs to be, doing what it needs to do so that this building stands up and shines out for the world. This is what we're supposed to be. We are a spiritual house a living, growing, corporately focused house. No Lone Ranger Christians. So if he's driving a point home, it's this. Growth in holiness is not individual only. Are we to grow personally? Yes. When you're alone, are you supposed to keep on pursuing growth? Yes. But in the midst of all that, we need to grow together. We were saved to join together and grow together as a unit. Corporate growth. We need each other. Do you realize that? You desperately need the people that are in this room. God brought us together. This brought this group together for a reason. Uniquely gifted each of you for a reason. And if you're not functioning, the building's tottering. It's not as strong as it ought to be. We're not going to be as beautiful as we ought to be. It's going to be dilapidated. We need to stand firm together. And we need to utilize the Word of God, studying it together, applying it together, sharing it with each other, growing in it together. It's a real joy. I've got, uh, we have a life group and a transformation group. And our transformation group of guys uh, just keeps sending things to each other all through the week sharing, hey, I'm struggling, I need prayer for this, sharing, hey, I just read this, this passage and it really meant a lot to me, or sharing, hey, I'm reading this particular book, would you all like to read it together? You know how encouraging that is? All week long to have that kind of fellowship? That's what church is supposed to be. It's not a Sunday morning, show up, check off the box, and go about your life. When we come here, we need to stimulate each other. Why? Because we're a spiritual house. I love this. The focus is not on buildings. In English, what do we call this building? Church. It's an English term. It is. It it, it is a church, and it is a church building. But the church building is simply where the what gathers? The church. We are the church, and when we gather, we put more of Christ on display. We encourage and we grow as God's house. And by nature, 
because we all share in the birth that he talked about in chapter one that was brought about by the word, we were all born again, we by nature are a part of a spiritual family. We are all one. I thought it was fascinating, one commentator mentioned that uh, the concept here is of a temple. There are seven mentioned in the Bible. They start with the tabernacle, and then you had Solomon's temple, which was destroyed. You had Zerubbabel's temple that was rebuilt. So you got three there. Then you have this age where the church is the temple of God. And then after this, we're gonna have a millennial temple or the tribulation temple, a millennial temple. And then what happens when we get to heaven? Who is the temple? God. God is. Seven temples over the course of all of human history and we're right square in the middle. We have the privilege of shining the light of Christ to a watching world and being a spiritual house. What a great reminder. If you're suffering physically, if someone's threatening your life, if they're coming and saying, we're gonna take your material stuff away, we're gonna take your job away, we're gonna take your health away, you can say, but I have something you cannot take away. You cannot touch my spirit. You may destroy my body, but you can't touch the part of me that's going to go into heaven for how long? Forever. What an incentive to stand firm, amen? We're living for things that are entirely different. We ought to be about things that are spiritual, not just physical. And we are a house where the Holy Spirit moves powerfully. So our desire here at at this church, The Bridge, we are not desiring simply to have impressive buildings. So what? Would we like to have our buildings be really nice? Yes or no? Would we like to have them function at a high level so we can do maximum work here for the glory of God? Yes. Would we like this piece of property to be an oasis here in the center of the valley that people could come and be refreshed and energized and learn about God and grow in their relationship with Him? Of course. But if you took all that away, we're still the church. We are a spiritual house and we are about spiritual things. So he says, that's what we are. We need to grow in that. And this spiritual house, temple, is where we grow for a holy priesthood. I love this. In the Old Testament, to be a part of the priesthood, first of all, you had to be of the Levitical line. So there were the Levites. But a subsection of the Levites were the priests. They were the offspring of Aaron. And so you were a priest, and the priests served in the temple. The high priest had the unique privilege of going in on the, whole, the, you know, the Day of Atonement and some other things, but the priests had these services in the temple. The rest of the Levites did other things that were around that. But what he's saying is, we're no longer under that. Now, you are the priests. Have you ever heard that? The priesthood of the believer? You are a priest. Look at the person next to you, remind them, you are a priest. Now, we have a hard time with this because we have weird ideas of priests. We have this strange idea that there's a distinction between clergy and, clergy and laity, right? There's only one difference. I'm paid to be good and you're good for nothing. See, that's all there is. <laughs> what did I just say? Oh, you could mistake what I meant. You are a priest. You currently have the functionality of a priest in this world. What did priests do? Well, priests had two primary focuses. The first one was Godward, that they were to know God and represent Him to people, to bring His truth, His holiness, His message to people. But the other thing they were to do was to represent people to God to intercede in prayer, to offer sacrifices, to do all the different things that they did to bring man and God together. That's what the priest was about. By the way, do you know why we chose the name for our church that we did, The Bridge? Because the church ought to be a bridge between God and a lost and dying world, right? We are priests, every one of us. You all have a serious responsibility before God to serve as a priest in this temple, to honor Him, to glorify Him, to lift His name on high, to bring Him to men and bring men to Him. And this is what it's all about. 
What was fascinating in the Old Testament was the priests had no possessions. They were not allowed to own anything, so they, did, they couldn't have uh, a lot of the things you would have, your own house, your own this, but they were given cities. And all across Israel, they had 48 Levitical cities. And I find this fascinating because in each city would be these priests who were to be the teachers of God's word and the ones who offered all the things they did so that, get this, there was no place within Israel where you could be more than 10 miles away from a priest. So everybody had access to hear the word of God taught faithfully. Wow, what a picture. The nation was to be leavened by the word of God. The word of God was to spread and fill and transform the people and the nation. That's what was supposed to happen. But when you read the Old Testament, quite often the prophets, the people they're castigating the most are the priests who were failing to do their job who got into wanting materialism and they wanted uh, prestige and they wanted their own sin and they were hiding things and being uh, negligent. And God had to keep coming after them. But in the New Testament, all believers are priests. We are a priesthood called by God, cleansed by God, clothed by God, set apart by God to be devoted to Him, set apart to serve Him with our entire life. How many portions of a day are you a priest? How often are you a priest? All the time. Are you only a priest during an hour and a half church service? No, you're a priest at work. You're a priest at home. You're a priest in your neighborhood. You're a priest when you drive. Everywhere you go, everything that you do, you are a representative of God to point people to Him. And when you see people that don't know Him, you want to tell them about Jesus and you want to intercede and pray on their behalf that God might grant them repentance that leads them to the knowledge of the truth. That's what priests do. This is, what, this is not just what we do, it's what we are and what we're supposed to always be about. We're a holy priesthood. I love that. That means we are a moral priesthood. We stand out as different from the world. We are holy. We are set apart. We are godly as a holy priesthood, living God's way for God's glory. Then he says, not only that, we're not just uh, New Testament priests. We are also to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, in the Old Testament, the priests had to offer up all kinds of sacrifices. They had... They had, uh, you can go back and read Leviticus 1 through 5 and see all the different sacrifices they offered and all the grain offerings and the libations and the oil and the incense and the sin offerings and on and on and on it goes. But what I find interesting as I was reading through this is what the New Testament says. What are the sacrifices a New Testament believer offers? Are you ready for this? Here we go. Number one, the first thing you sacrifice is yourself. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice. One guy said the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. You are a living sacrifice. You are supposed to offer yourself unreservedly, completely, wholly, totally, nothing held back. God, I am all yours. Every part of my being, everything I am, everything I own, I am set apart to you. I sacrifice my life to please you and you alone. I die to self and I live to God. Secondly, Paul mentions in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, that he had some financial needs as a missionary. And he praises the Philippian church because unlike most of the other churches, they once again joined in and they offered a fragrant aroma. They gave him a financial gift and God saw that as like a sacrifice a priest would offer in the Old Testament. Do you realize that when you give of your financial resources, it is a sacrifice to God? 
You are saying, Lord, I want you to take this and I want you to use this for your glory. I want you to advance your purposes around the world. And God sees that just like a priest offering a sacrifice. There's a third one. Hebrews 13 talks about us offering our service to one another. And right before that, in verse 15, he talks about offering a sacrifice of praise, that we would give thanks with our lips to God. So when you offer yourself, you offer finances, you offer service, you offer praise. And the fifth one that I found in Romans 15, verse 16, Paul talks about an offering of the Gentiles that had come to saving faith. We offer souls to God. When you go out and you lead someone to faith in Jesus Christ, you are offering them as a sacrifice to God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? So we have this challenge that as the church, we are to grow in all of these things because some of these things are hard. Can we agree with that? Is it hard to give your entire self to the Lord? Is it hard to give of your hard-earned money? Is it hard to serve others when you want to be served? Of course, all of these things. But God says, you're a priest, and this is what you're supposed to do. So now that he's told us what, grow together, back in verse 4, he tells us how. Look at this in verse 4. I love this. Very short phrase. It's one word. And coming to him. Coming. This is an interesting word. It means to approach or to move toward And often the way it's used, it's a reciprocal thing. So he's saying, how do we grow? What is the primary way that we can grow together in Christ to grow closer to Jesus? As we all grow closer to Jesus, we grow closer to who else? One another. We come to him. And the way the word is described there, it's a continuous, habitual approach not just to come and say, hi, Lord, but to desire intimate fellowship. I am coming to Jesus because I want to know him. I want to be near him. I want to see his face. I want to experience his character. I want him to teach me. I want to sit at his feet like Mary. I want to learn from him. And the reciprocal side is, as I draw near to him, what does he do? He draws near to me. That's what it says in James 4. So I am drawing near. That's how we grow. We grow as we come near to Jesus in intimate communion, corporately here, and that's the key. I've talked to so many people, especially in our modern day, and we have people that call themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S. It's a growing number of people in the church. We have people, all kinds of folks that are saying, I don't need the church anymore. I'm just going to go. It's just me and God. I'm just going to go be spiritual out in the, in, the, you know, in the mountains or at the beach or on the golf course, and it's just me and God. You know the problem with that? That is not biblical at all, not biblical. God did not save us for isolation. God saved us to be corporate, to be together, and to draw near to him together. I'll tell you one thing, if somebody that I'm close to, if I'm sitting next to somebody and they're genuinely drawing near to the Lord, what does that do to me? It pulls me along with them. I see what the Lord's doing in their life, and I want more of that. When somebody is growing, I want to grow too. When someone has the joy of the Lord, I want the joy of the Lord too. When someone is singing his praises, I want to sing his praises too. When someone is telling that they just had the privilege of sharing the gospel with someone, I want to go it too. Are you with me on that? There is a corporate commitment here that we are doing this habitually together. We prioritize gathering as living stones to build this church for the glory of God. It's a priority. Do you think that's a priority in our culture today? Joe just got back from India where it's a priority. I remember going there years ago, one of the first times I went, and Ryder took me to a church And the service started around 9, but people were already there at 7. Praying. Singing. Nobody telling them to, nobody directing it. They were just on their own there worshiping the Lord. Well, that was moving to me because in America, people arrive kind of 15, 20, 30 minutes after the service starts, not two hours before. 
And so here I am at this church, and I see this guy come in. No legs. And he had these little wooden things with handles on them. And that's how he walked. He would do this and then lift his body forward and down again and do this. And I asked somebody, and he, was, he went up the stairs into the church. I said, uh, where did that guy come from? It's like, did, did Uber just drop him off? No, he lives a couple kilometers from here. Probably left hours before seven so he could get there two hours before a church service that lasted three and a half hours. And then he had to go back home. That's commitment. It's corporate growth. Wow. Why? Why would we do this? Because quite frankly, if I know the church is being persecuted, if I know if I identify with you, there's guilt by association. If I know you're being hammered and I get near you, I might get hammered too. You, you with me here? Does that motivate some people to say, hey, then I don't, I don't, you know, I'll just, I'm fine, I'll watch on the live stream. I'll stay away. I don't want people to know. You know, I'll kind of quietly love Jesus. I won't, I won't identify with his body. Why would I stick my neck out? Why would I be committed to gathering with the church no matter what it might cost me? I believe that's what Peter answers. And the first thing is because of who Jesus is. He says we come to him as a living stone. The Greek word for stone there is different than the word which we often think of the word stone applied to Peter, Petros. This is the Greek word lithos. It referred to a particular stone that in the quarry craftsmen perfectly cut, measured, made it absolutely perfectly straight on all sides so that it would fit and do its job exactly. That's the word that he uses here. It was cut so it could do its job. It's not just a piece of, you know, a rock on the side of the road. And what he's saying is this. He's going to call him in a moment the cornerstone. He is the stone perfectly designed so that everything else can be built upon it. We come to him for who he is. He's a living stone. He's alive from the dead, amen? Jesus is alive. There is no other leader of any religion that's still alive. They've all died and they're all in their graves. Jesus rose from the dead, ascended, and is at the right hand of the throne of God, and he's coming back, and he's king of kings and lord of lords. Can you say amen to that? He's alive. He's the resurrection and the life. He is a living stone, but he's a perfectly designed stone. And so I can build my life on him. I can do everything in relationship to him. Yet, Peter says, he was rejected by men. Even though he was perfectly matched to be the Messiah, even though he completely, perfectly lined up with everything God said the Messiah would be, they still rejected him. They still turned away from him, but now he's highly exalted. And I think what Peter's saying is this, don't be intimidated by people that ever say, why would you follow that Jesus guy? Who in the world is that? And you can say, oh, I'll tell you why I follow him. He's the living stone. He is the one perfectly designed. He is the only one who can be the foundation of the church. He's the only one who can give me eternal life. And by the way, men may not like him, but in God's sight, he's choice and precious. Choice. He was elect of God. He is the only Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except what? through him. No man. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be. It's it. He's the only one. He is God's choice. And if you don't choose him, there's no other option. So first of all, I'll pay any price for him and I'll sacrifice to let others know about him because he is it. There's no one else. And in God's sight, he's precious. He's highly prized. He's worth more than anything else. And if God says that about him, that's good enough for me. Amen? Amen? Good enough for me. I will be committed to doing what I'm supposed to do to represent him as his priest in his temple because he deserves it. 
He is the Son of God, the sinless man, the prophet, priest, king, Lord of lords, mediator, propitiator, substitutionary sacrifice, risen and ascended Lord. He's at the right hand of God. He's the living stone, the foundation of the church, and he's coming back soon. And so I can live for him. And that's why I am motivated because of who he is. And I get to come to him. Think about that. That's the one I get to have fellowship with. I'm not coming to some stained glass Messiah. I'm not coming to some normal dude. I am coming to the living God who is the foundation of my life. So I not only have that, but as a priest, I'm offering spiritual sacrifices because Jesus is alive. He's the chosen one. He's of infinite worth. And because this fully 100% agrees with what scripture already said. He completely lines up with, with everything the Old Testament said about the Messiah. And so Peter quotes some passages here in verses 6 through 8. He starts first, he says, for this is contained in Scripture. This is holy truth from God. This is written words that we can study and we can go to them. And as we're studying them to grow, we learn about Jesus. You search the Scriptures because you think in them they have eternal life and they speak of me, Jesus said. If you want to grow, you've got to know me. If you want to be saved, you've got to know me. I am the focus of the Bible. And so what was true in the Old Testament times about Jesus, what was true in the times of Peter, is it still true today? Jesus is the way. It goes with Scripture. Have you ever heard this phrase, I want to be on the right side of history? It's being used a lot today by very immoral people who believe that they've finally turned the tide and they've had some laws passed that allow them to be immoral. And like Romans 1, you know, 1 says, they, they're celebrating their immorality. They're having parades and they're doing all this stuff. I want to tell you something. If you are ever opposed to the word of God, you are on the wrong side of history. Period. Brothers and sisters, we look to this word for every area of life. We depend on it. We trust in it. We live it because it's absolutely true. And Peter quotes a text out of Isaiah 28, verse 16. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. He's a choice stone. He's precious. Some think it's the capstone because the word corner could be cap. So it could be like an arch where the last stone that goes in is the one that holds it all together. Could be that, but I think it's the cornerstone. Why? Because the cornerstone, and I've seen this at the temple in Israel, Temple Mount, it's perfectly cut and then everything else lines up with it. So all the other stones come up against it and they go straight up and down because they're aligned with it. So when we come to Jesus, as he says in order to grow, we come for alignment. You ever have your car, your front end go out of alignment? and you have to go get the front end alignment, that's what happens every week when you come to church. Somewhere during the week, you kind of go off off kilter from the truth of the Word of God, and you come and you align with Jesus and His truth. So it's it's an alignment and it's a calibration, might be another term some of you might use. You calibrate your life by Him. You line up to Him. You build everything on Him because He's the precious cornerstone. And he says, if you do that, you'll never be disappointed. The word means you'll never hope in something that will disappoint. You'll never be ashamed. There's never a day you're going to stand before God and go, oh no, I, I missed it. I, I, I blew it by trusting in Jesus. He says, nope, never going to happen. If you believe in Jesus, you'll never be ashamed. Now, what about the people that are persecuting you? What about the people saying you're a fool for following Christ? What's going to happen to them someday? When every knee bows and every tongue confesses. And then when Jesus sends them to where they rightfully deserve to go, to hell for all eternity, he says, that's what's going to happen. You won't be disappointed, but they will. This precious value is for you who believe. If you trust in him exclusively, he will give you this value, this sense that you'll never be ashamed, that you can be anchored in that. You can be absolutely assured. Why? Because the stone which the builders rejected became the cornerstone. Jesus quotes that in Matthew 21, applies that to himself. That's from Psalm 118. The leaders of Israel rejected Jesus, and people still do it. But for those who trust in him, you will never be disappointed. But verse 8, look at this. He is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Okay, get the picture here. God creates a stone. It's perfectly fitted to do what it's supposed to do. You reject it. You study it. You look at it. You evaluate it and say, I don't want it. 
and you just throw it out in the field. Somebody else comes walking along and they trip over that stone and they fall and Jesus becomes to them the stumbling stone that they trip over and the rock of offense is when they hit the ground. That solid rock ground they land on is what he's talking about. When you trip over a rock and fall and land on rock, what does that do to you? It hurts, big time. Jesus takes it a step further, and when he quotes that passage in Matthew and Mark, he says that that stone then crushes them. Why? He's the only living stone. He's the only cornerstone. There is no other option, beloved. Why are we gathering together to grow in him? Because he's the only way. We're doing this because it's, there's no other chance for people. He's the only hope. And if people reject Jesus, they will trip over him and ultimately be crushed by him. And he says they stumble because they're disobedient to the word and to this doom they were appointed. By the way, the word doom is in italics. Some people get overzealous with this verse and they think of double predestination and they think that you know God predestined some for eternal life and he predestined these others to go to hell. What the verse really says here, and this is critical, the word there that he, when he talks about that they were um, appointed for this, the, this does not refer to the idea of disobedience. It refers to stumbling. They were appointed to stumble because of their disobedience. When they said there is no way to get to heaven through Jesus, they're done. There is no other way. And so they stumble. And God appoints that you either believe in Jesus and go to heaven, or you don't believe in Jesus and you go where? That's it. There's only two roads, no other options. So we commit ourselves to grow together in him because of who he is and because of what scripture says. And thirdly and finally, because of who we were saved to be and what we were saved to do. I love verse nine, but you are. This is your identity. This is who you are in Christ. If you are born again, this is true of you. You are a chosen race. The word race is genus there. It refers to family or kind. You were chosen and brought into this race. Is there a lot of weird stuff in our world about race? Bizarre stuff, people arguing, fighting over race. Like, guess how many races are in the world? One, human, period. We're all of the human race. But if you're saved, you're of another race. You are now the family of God, the genus of God. And you are that together. You are a chosen race. You are different from the world. You were called out of the world. You are also a royal priesthood. Earlier you were a holy moral priesthood. Now you're a royal priesthood. What does that mean? Someday in the millennial kingdom and on into the eternal state, we will blank and blank with Christ. We will rule and reign with him. We are not only priests, we are kings. You hear what I said? Now, Jesus is still the king of kings, but under him, we are royalty. You have royal blood in you. you ever, I don't know if you've watched any of the movies about England and the, and the crown and all the throne. You are royalty. Look at the person next to you and say, man, you are royalty. You are a prince or a princess. You are royalty. You are a royal priesthood. You are a priest and a king. Wow, you are a holy nation. We are a nation inside of a nation. Is America a holy nation? Uh, it's getting worse. Is the church a holy nation? Yes. We are a city set on a hill and we are a light shining in the world. We are a holy nation. We are set apart. We are radically different. We are salt and light and we stand together that way. We are a people for God's own possession. He treasures us. He loves you. He desires you. He wants you. He's not negligent of you. If you're being persecuted, you're being hammered, you ultimately are martyred. It's not because he's not looking. He loves you more than you could ever imagine, and he treasures you. That's why he chose you and bought you with a price. For what reason? That we might publish the good news that God is excellent, and he has called us out of darkness into light. What a privilege. Why am I a priest? Why am I set apart? Why do I gather? Why do I want to grow? So I can and so you can individually and corporately broadcast to the world that Jesus saves. 
He can call you out of your darkness. He can save you from that wretched life. He can give you power over sin. He can save you from the wrath to come. That's what he does. You can build your life on him and enjoy it. And you can share in this massively, gloriously beautiful fellowship. And you can go reach others just like you've been reached. Why? Because God's merciful. You say, Lord, I I don't deserve this. I don't know about you guys, but I still struggle with sin. Anybody else here with me? Okay, most of you still sin. It's not a, I'm not saying it's a great idea, but I'm just saying it's a reality. God is so merciful. He's so merciful. He continually chooses not to give us what we deserve. Does the world need to hear that? People that are overwhelmed with guilt and sorrow and shame to be able to hear God says, ah, I paid for all of that. I'm not going to give you judgment. You can pass out a judgment into life if you'll come to the cornerstone. He can do that for you. And we get to tell people about that. Isn't that glorious? We were once a pe- not a people, but now we're the people of God. We had not received mercy. Now we've received mercy. And the greatest thing of all is, I get to enjoy His fellowship and His compassion and His love for eternity. And there's nothing anybody in this world can do to take that away. Isn't that fantastic? That's what we're going to celebrate as we partake of these elements to commune with Jesus, to focus on Him together, to remind ourselves of the price He paid as He became one of us, which is so humbling, I can't imagine, to live a sinless life, to suffer and die in my place, to to shed His blood, to die that I might be forgiven, to rise that I might have life. Are you thankful for that? That's what we're going to celebrate in a few moments. And I believe if you heard what I've just said this morning, and if you're willing to join in and we can lock arms and say, let's do this together, I believe we can be a beautiful church. We can be a church that the world looks at and goes, wow, that's real. They may not like our message but they're going to be blown away by the beautiful way we love each other and love God and serve Him with our entire being. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we pray that this would be true. We want to be that kind of a church. And we want to be able to honor You, as You've told us, by being holy, by drawing close to Jesus, ever closer to Jesus, to be like Him, represent him help us lord in the remaining time we have here today to not only reflect on jesus and how we can be closer to him but how we can help each other grow that every part of this body every part of this living building this house would grow together and represent you well thank you for the privilege of doing that in jesus name